Hello, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich, back with the Clinical Neurophysiology channel, and in this video I'm going to be talking about what we see during sleep with regard to the brain waves, and we know this as sleep architecture. Now, sleep is a very big, complex subject, which is a somewhat akin to oceanography, in that the seas, water around us, are something which are absolutely critically important to life, and yet, although we know a lot about it, there is still so much more to learn. And in a similar way, sleep is very similar. There's a lot that we do know about it, an awful lot more to learn. One thing I can say, and this is not going to go into theories of sleep, but sleep is primarily a state of reduced energy expenditure, and I think that that would be a very true statement. Now, the workings and orchestrations of the brain during this period are complex, but importantly, and this is the point that I want to make with this video really, they are organized. And so it's not just when we go to sleep, our brains just mindlessly turn off. There are things that happen during this. And we generally divide sleep into either rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, and non-REM sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep. And the non-REM has got several stages associated with that. Now, the different sleep stages have got certain ways of scoring them with very defined criteria. And the first really agreed criteria that became international were the Rechtschaffen and Kale's 1968 um, sleep scoring manual. Um, and that has been moved on a little bit um, in terms of the American Academies of Sleep Medicine sleep scoring manual. Um, really in 2007 was the first sort of major update. And, um, and then there have been subsequent updates ever since. But for a neurophysiologist, although we can be talking about uh, a sleep score for a particular stage of sleep, that's really in reference to a particular epoch, a particular um, swathe of time with which we score um, what sleep stage someone is in. But really, sleep is a continuum, and there's constant fluctuations within this. So within the non-REM sleep criteria or, or stages, we have non-REM sleep uh, one, two, and three. Now, there used to be four as well, um, but from 2007, stage two and three got put together. So it's really one, two, and three. We have REM, and then we have the state of being awake. The typical hypnogram, which you'll see on websites and in books, looks something like this, where we start off awake, we finish awake, and we have sleep happening in between, usually as a set of cycles, one, two, three, four, possibly five. And what happens is, is we descend down from wakefulness into REM 1, then into REM 2, and then down into REM 3. And then we cycle into REM sleep, and then we descend back down again into REM 2, 3, back into REM. And you'll notice that in the earlier part of the night, we spend more time in REM 3, and during the latter part of the night, we are in REM sleep. But um, this is not um, absolutely uh, what happens in real life. This is me uh, back in 2005 in my first foray into sleep medicine. Um, and this is me wearing some polysomnography uh, kit. And I'll talk about that um, perhaps at a future point. Um, but what you can see here are there are lots of different leads and channels that we record. And what happens in a typical multi-channel polysomnogram is one eventually builds up data which form into a picture something like this. So we have our hypnogram over here, which we'll go into a bit more detail soon. We have our oxygen saturations. We have flow of air across the nose and mouth. We've got snore sensors, limb movement sensors. Um, we've got our, our cardiac event uh, monitor there. We're looking at our heart rates. We can look at position. Um, we can look at the respiratory movements as well. And um, it, it's all very fascinating. And again, we'll talk about that in more detail at some future point. Now, in real life, this is um, you know, the hypnogram from above. Um, you can see that the hypnogram does not look as uh, romanticized, perhaps, as in that uh, diagram which I showed you before. So what you can see quite clearly over here, and this is because it's from 2005, you'll see there's um, non-REM 1, 2, 3, and 4. These days it would just be 1, 2, and 3. You can see a descent down into deep sleep in the earlier part of the night, then hovering around lighter sleep, and then down into deeper sleep over there, 
And then in the latter part, you're not really seeing that deeper state of sleep, but you're seeing increasing amounts of REM sleep. So um, in real life, yes, we do have more non-REM sleep at the beginning of the night, particularly in the slow wave sleep uh, stages. Um, but as the night progresses, we are more into the uh, REM side of it. Now, we've talked about the awake EEG in a previous video, and yet 95% of us will have an alpha rhythm. And, you know, this is what looks like in relaxed wakefulness. So um, I've gone into this in more detail previously. You can click the eye card above. Um, but what you can see over here are eye movements over there. And as the eyelids close, one can see the alpha activity over there of relaxed wakefulness. Now, drowsiness and non-REM1 are a little bit of a continuum. Obviously, from a, a point of view and perspective of someone who's trying to score sleep, we have to have defined cutoffs, and I'm not going into the exact way in those, which those cutoffs occur, but from a neurophysiologist's point of view, where we're not out to uh, do formal sleep scoring per se, um, what happens is as follows. We get attenuation of alpha activity. It then gets replaced by lower voltage mixed frequency theta activities. We lose the large amplitude rapid eye movement artifacts. and Instead, we get slow ro rolling eye movements. And then at some point, there might be something called hypnagogic hypersynchrony, which we will be able to appreciate, um, and vertex waves, V waves. And just to show you what happens over here, so the um, alpha activity it starts to attenuate. You can't see it so well here. Then we start getting slow rolling eye movements. So these are these slow rolls over here like so. And then if you have a look down here, this is over the vertex. You start having these small little V waves which start appearing and they become larger in amplitude and then you start to see them in little bursts and then at some point uh, one descends into non-REM2 sleep which is characterized by sleep spindles and K complexes. Now there are other phenomena from a neurophysiologist perspective um, that also can occur in uh, REM2 uh, but they don't actually count towards sleep scoring and are more of interest to us from a neurological perspective per se. So what then happens after the V waves start becoming more prominent is one starts to see the emergence of sleep spindles like this. And at some point they start overlapping with the vertex waves and then they become designated as K complexes. And all of this become more prominent um, as the descent into sleep becomes more established. So you can see over here spindle activity with vertex waves, pure spindle over there, large vertex wave with spindle activity. Now from a polysomnographer's perspective, um, they, we, independent of how, how we re refer to ourselves, um, don't tend to look at as many channels as we do. And what tends to occur is that sleep is scored based on uh, one or two leads, usually the C4A1 or C3A2. So that's basically a uh, cross section of the brain slicing, let's say, on the right hand side from the paracentral region down to the other mastoid and taking that huge swathe of activity. And you can see over here, this is what sleep spindles, vertex waves and K complexes would look like. So if I just go back to the previous page, these are equivalent pages, but you get a more condensed version of sleep architecture when this occurs. Now, of course, there are more channels that can be plugged into um, to a standard polysonography uh, kit and also even with sort of neurophysiology kit you can add in extra sensors too um, but um, th you know these are the the bare bones of what are looked at now in non-rem uh, three sleep which is the next stage what then happens is that over 20 percent of an epoch uh, will be comprised of delta slow wave activity. Um, some people may have some frontal alpha frequency components as well on top, and that's known as alpha delta sleep, and we won't go into that right now. And this is what it looks like. 
So you can see these large amplitude slow wave uh, rhythms occurring over there. Sometimes you may see some uh, spindly activity with, as well with them, but this is slow wave um, sleep or NREM3. Moving into REM sleep, we have a low voltage background. We have large amplitude rapid eye movements and reduced muscle tone or for a neurophysiologist, a lack of muscle artifact. And this, I can tell you, is REM sleep. And it looks remarkably like wakefulness, except that from our perspective, we don't have any of the muscle artifacts that would be normally associated with wakefulness. And so uh, for us, it's still quite uh, straightforward to uh, define REM sleep, um, but um, from a polysomnographer's uh, perspective, there would also be uh, muscle tone channels as well, where you can have a look at the muscle tone. And also just to note that as one descends into deeper stages of sleep, muscle tone tends to uh, decrease from REM 1, 2 and 3, but in REM there ought to be atonia, although now there are some uh, emerging um, ways of thinking about REM, REM with uh, atonia and REM without atonia, but that's another story altogether. Now, through sleep, in, we talk about cycles. So in theory, there are four to five cycles that occur throughout the night as per the um, romanticized hypnogram. Um, but, um, you know, there, there are definitely cycles that go on. But within sleep stages, there are at times uh, cyclical variations uh, known as CAP. And just to highlight this, this is a condensed uh, version of time. So you can see lots of, uh, these are vertex waves actually uh, going on over here. So each one of these boxes now is a second. Um, so you can see periods of time when there's more activity, periods of time when there's less activity, more activity, less activity, more activity, less activity. All this requires orchestration and it essentially comes out of the brainstem. The circuits involved are obviously complex, and the information coming out of the brainstem has to be networked across the vast swathes of cortex which are producing those signals. So there are very diffuse projections. So uh, on that point, I'm going to say thank you very much. I hope that's been a useful overview and um, you're welcome to ask questions down below. But in the next video, I'm going to be talking about epilepsy and sleep in a little bit more detail and talking about how the networking aspect plays into both. All the very best and see you then.